quite a few talks. Hi, um, my name's Stuart McConville. Um, I'm a landlord and uh, an environmental consultant in Nimbin, and um, I've been thinking about housing solutions and housing issues for a very long time, actually. Um, one in particular came to me years ago when I saw some cows on the road, and it might seem pretty left field at the moment, but from cows on the road, I went to, hmm, broken fences. Hmm, oh, okay, the cows were registered and the property owner didn't really know how to fix the fences. Hmm, okay, so why was that? Because he's got 100 acres and he's, bought, and he's just moved up from the city and he doesn't know anything about fencing. And he's just adjusted the cattle. And it got me thinking, you know, the, the laws in New South Wales regarding subdivision of 100 acre lots uh, go back to 1973. So prior to then, people could subdivide down to smaller lots, but ne then they put a stop on it. And they said, okay, agricultural land's really important. Let's keep it really big. And they said, okay, no more subdividing 100 acre lots. So consequently, we've got vast amounts of 100 acre lots on the north coast that are now unsustainable for grazing cattle. Used to be sustainable, no longer sustainable. So they're registered. So my proposition was to think about ways that the government could allow for subdividing some of those 100 acre lots. Um, which obviously would release a lot of land into the community and if they sold that land would also release a lot of funds into the community. So I started an idea called the Eco Division Policy, which was a policy that would require a state government sort of SEP, or state, state, environmental, state environmental planning policy. Um, at the moment, uh, councils can actually um, strategically plan for this eventuality, but they don't. They simply don't. Nobody wants to go against the state government's 100 acre subdivision law. There's a lot of detail. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Yep. Oh, this is just an overview. Oh, I, I didn't miss. I missed the overview bit. Okay. So, all right. So, it's a policy regarding how to release some of that land for housing and release some of it for. Um, and the other thing I, I wanted to talk about, which was, I'll just give you a quick brief, is a shelter values community charter, which is a, a ten point um, set of. Uh, um, stipulations or recommendations that real estate agents would uh, undertake under a charter. But we'll go into that later. Thanks, Stuart. Thanks, Stuart. Um, Philip, would you like to just come to the mic just to give people the perspective that you are going to present and uh, you're coming from? Um, and introduce it's very ad, ad hoc. My name's Phil Pratt. I'm an architect. I'm 40 years. Um, I, I have a company called Bush Pavilions. And we, we started out here at Kunga um, probably about 30 years ago. I now operate in, um, in Brisbane. And I've been developing a, a, a modular housing system based on um, a, a panel system that's, that's developed from a post and beam system. And the, the idea is that, that it's component architecture. So, so it's not just building, it's not just f fabrication, it's not just production. It's something that, that still maintains the architecture um, yet still is, is, um, is low cost in terms of its assembly. But, but even, even apart from all that, my, my big point of view is that that's often missed is that the, the key to low cost housing is not so much the actual fabric of the building, but the actual land itself. Well, l l since the 70s, when, or, or it, when the stock market crashed, everyone was looking for new investments. And, um, and land became that, that commodity that you could you could buy a lump of and carve it up and, and put curb and guttering and then sell it for enormous profits. And then the, the land itself continues to escalate in, 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 in value, even though it's, it's not really doing it. Even it's, it's improved by the, the buildings put on it, but it's, as, as a commodity, it's become something that, that's, that's, um, that's been allowed to go over and, and escalate. So that, that's just my, that's my big point of view. That's my main point of view, sorry.
we have a PowerPoint presentation? Uh, we don't have a PowerPoint presentation. None. We don't, we, we don't know how to make a PowerPoint presentation, and if there was uh, one presented uh, in, in, in complete form, that would be fine. Um, so, so what I'm saying is that we have approximately one and a half hours, and um, we've got four speakers, and perhaps, Dudley, are you going to say anything to... Yeah, so that's five speakers. So I think if we have 15 minutes each, and then that allows us a bit of room for uh, for some discussion at the end. So um, who would like to... Do you, do you guys want to be first, or...? They're, they're all, they will all be 15 minutes. Yes, you can do that if you wish. That's fine, yeah. Yes, if you have one, and you can perhaps go like later on the track and you can get that ready and we'll pass the mic to someone else. Yep, that's fine. You can talk from it. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, there are individual slides there. I could possibly put them up if that... Was that the, the one that you brought in earlier, which was just in a, on a hard drive? Yeah. It is? I've got one, I've got one, um, I've got one hard drive or, or, or memory stick. Now you may have three on it, but it wasn't presented in PowerPoint, so we can't show it. But I could show the individual slides if you like. Okay. All right, okay. All right. So perhaps we'll get someone else on first, and then we'll, we'll try and get that together for you. Um, Stuart, you might like to uh, to start. Thanks, David. Um, yeah, so I probably gave you half the story already, um, erroneously. But um, essentially, the the discussion paper that I've got a copy of there for a, a, anybody who wants a copy of it. Um, it presents a plan to ask the, the state government to amend legislation or st put in place a state, a state environmental planning policy so that um, they can strategically plan for the release of some of these 100-acre uh, lots or divide up some of these 100-acre lots. And that could be around Lismore, for example, or Rosebank, where there's a huge amount of flood-affected housing stock that's currently got nowhere to go. Um, it could be for tiny homes. It could be for uh, rural workers' cottages. But the idea essentially is that this subdivided land wouldn't have a dwelling entitlement, a conventional dwelling entitlement. It would simply be for horticultural pursuits and for low-cost um, dwellings, w with the exception of the flood-affected housing stock, obviously, because people need somewhere to live after they've... Uh, and by the way, uh, some of my friends in Lismore have been offered um, the, the buyback for their land and, and they get the house for free. So they actually can take the house and put, put it where they like and go and live in it somewhere else. The government is paying them for their house and then they get to take the house away. But right now there's nowhere to put the house. So this solves that problem. Um, the plan that I've got is, is a... Um, it's a bit convoluted, but if you were to apply for this subdivision policy uh, through council, if you were to put a development application in for this subdivision, um, you would put in a riparian revegetation plan, you would put in a business plan for a horticultural development, and after three years of establishing the riparian restoration works on the property, you would be given the right to subdivide. So it's a bit of a, um, an application process and it would, it would involve the, the restoration of land. Um, some of these 100 acre lots, as you may or may not know, are pretty much weed infested because nobody has the time or energy to go out and cut down the devil's figs and uh, deal with the lantana and the crofton weed and the, uh, you know, and the groundsel and all these other weeds that are becoming an environmental issue on the North Coast. Um, <laughs> got, a, got a show stealer here. Um, <coughs> so, so that's the essence of the idea. Um, I've, I've pitched it to Janelle Saffin who really liked the idea. She, she thought it could have potential, like I said, for rehousing some of those uh, beautiful old homes in Lismore which are either going to be demolished or put somewhere. Um, and it really does have the potential to release a lot of funds back into the community for um, horticulture, uh, planning, planners, reveg bush, re bush regenerators. Uh, there's a lot of money tied up in that land. <laughs> uh, 
there's a lot of money tied up in that land and over the next few years I think this economy, our little economy, could do with um, a dose of that, that money that's trapped essentially in these 100 acre lots. It could flow through our community and help deal with what is probably going to be a little bit of a recession in the years to come. So that, that is essentially, um, that's essentially the, the first idea I had. I might say I'm a, I'm a landlord. I've got two places that are empty at the moment. Um, I, <laughs> okay, I've got a tenant already. <laughs> two tenants, fantastic. Um, I've been renting a place for 12, 13 years now. Um, and I've done what you're probably not supposed to do. I've just built another place on my land. Um, and rented it out. I've sort of flown by the seat of my pants with that. I've always had really good relationships with my neighbours and I've provided a home for people. And now I've got a little tiny home as well. So I provide two homes for two groups of people along with myself. So my land now has people on it and, that, and those people are what I need. Sometimes I can employ my, my neighbour. You know, sometimes I give him a day's work to go and help me plant some trees. So I, I took on a cow paddock in 1997 and <laughs> my dad said all right you want some land do you i said yeah he said, oh. so i basically blackmailed my mum to <laughs> bit of a funny story but i told my mum that i was either going to go and grow a shitload of pot and buy some land or ask her brother for a lot of money to buy some land and she says don't you ask my brother for any money i'll talk to your father <laughs> so I ended up getting a, a really cheap plot of land, but my dad said it has to have no trees and no house on it. And he knew that that was a pretty good move. It was a smart move because I put the trees on it and I put the house on it. But I've done that with all the, the people power. And that's what I think the land needs. The land needs a lot of people on it to get some stuff done because it's suffering at the moment. So that's, um, I guess, a bit of the philosophy behind why I've, I've done this. Um, the, the other idea I've got uh, is not a silver bullet and it doesn't really uh, lend itself to solving homes, but what it may do is collectively keep real estate agents and property managers in check. And the premise here is that housing is like food, it's like healthcare, it, it's like water, it's a right, it's a human right. And we have doctors that take an oath to supply us with healthcare. We have accountants that are chartered so that we know that they're going to be honest with our money. But real estate agents and property managers, they don't need to do anything like that. They can be shonky as all hell and sometimes they actually are. I mean, we've got some really good ones here. But my idea is to get the government or get at least start with a voluntary process where real estate agents are chartered. So they become chartered against a set of guiding principles and those principles are there for the, the community, and therefore the um, and the community therefore up um, checks checks in with them and audits their process against those guiding principles. And I'll, I'll read them out. I've got my glasses here. So the charter, as I see it, would be um, it's a ten point plan, and that communities need housing security, i.e., people that live in the area for more than five years who are actively engaged with the community, should be prioritised for rehousing within the area that they live. So that's the first thing that a real estate agent would say: yes, we'll do that. So prioritise local people, and that and that keeps the community together. It prevents a bit of the old, um, you know, gentrification. Of pe you know, people coming from other communities and and bidding more and paying more for for housing. Communities need carers. Relatives of community members that come to live and care for the loved ones should be given priority for housing where required. Communities respect elders. Older members of our community are given priority for housing in the immediate area that they have traditionally lived. Communities look after their own. Communities expect that disadvantaged members of the community are respected and that their needs are met where possible. Communities respect collectives. Where property is collectively managed, community expects due process to be followed by agents where speculation occurs. And this is a special one for Nimbin because, you know, we collectively own a few different things and anyway, I won't go into rumours. Communities expect engagement. 
agents work in partnership with relevant organisations to promote community housing and to contribute to socially inclusive communities. Communities expect Indigenous people's housing needs to be prioritised by maintaining connection to country for local mob. Communities expect full disclosure of land sharing communities' policies and bylaws to, pers to prospective tenants and purchasers. And communities respect the environment. Again, full disclosure of the environmental responsibilities of the tenants and prospective purchasers, i.e. toilets. I mean, I don't know. I'm a, I do toilets and septics. I don't know how many times I've been out to somebody who's just bought a property, had no idea the septic was failing, and, and they've... And, the, and I have to hit them up with a bill for thirty thousand dollars to fix it, and they've just bought the property and they've got no more money. This happens because the real estate agents don't tell them; they don't want to tell them. Communities are actively adapting to climate change. The rental homes should have the same quality venting, insulation, and heating, cooling opportunities as we move into more extreme um, environments. You know, weather events. So using these 10 basic outlines the, you know, and by signing that charter, the, the property managers promote and adhere to this ethos. And then my, my idea was to do it voluntarily, so that would be like a branding operation. You'd basically go and pr provide these real estate agents and property managers with a brand that they can use once they're into this system and audit it. So hopefully that encourages it. Well, if, the, if it doesn't work, we could say to the state government, look, we tried to do this the nice way and nobody would take it on. No, no, and, and they're a really reasonable set of principles. So I think we could have a win-win, potentially. You know, if the branding operation failed, you could just go to the state government and say, look, we tried this, just legislate something. Legislate a charter for, for real estate agents so that they actually look after people in the community. Um, okay, that's pretty much time's up. First part. The, the well, just about how do we get the government to say they will approve this? They made an exemption. Yeah. And then they said, we'll see if it works. So it's just, we'll mention this in our presentation, but the New South Wales government has done experimental areas which are exempt from the normal laws. They could see what you could do and if it would work, and then they introduced it into the state legislation and guided people on how to go about it. Thank you, Adrian. The same applies for the uh, first, the eco division policy too. Uh, the state government can set aside certain areas to experiment with, and not even that. Councils have the planning power, like that when they do the LEPs every ten years, they have the power to to experiment. And actual state government encourages them to do it. They just don't do it because it's difficult, and they. They, um, I really not sure why they don't do it, but I spoke to lots of councils about it and they couldn't really answer that question. Hi, um, I really appreciate what you're saying and I'd love to have your charter, but I feel like the reality is we keep asking for permission that never is delivered. I've worked in lots of communities where we've created the buildings and then we've asked for the apology afterwards. The council's turned up and told us that, you know, we've got 10% more to do and we're like, great, so we'll do it for you. Um, I believe that we are in a time where they're not going to be able to provide us with any support. I'm about to go to council on Monday just for showers for homeless people in Brunswick. Um, I believe we're going to have a lot more homeless if we don't look at your charter but leave off the real estate agents. Um, can I respond to that? Move on. Okay. Yeah. Much. We have a. Sorry. David? Yeah, we're ready. Do you have the PowerPoint present? Uh, we're on. Title page. I'm, I can't hear. Oh, me, me. 
I was wondering with the 100 acres, if you had a size, you, were they going to be cut up? Yeah. yeah. Was there, sorry? Just 50-50. Into a 50 acre block. Well, two, two lots of 50. Okay. Also I didn't, I didn't lots catch it. Mm -hmm. so a okay. So both lots are still sustainably viable for um, horticulture. Still doing that. Okay. Thank you. Are we ready? Hi, everybody. It's wonderful to see people who want to be practical and do bottom-up solutions. So I'm Adrian Weber. This is Erwin Weber. But first, I'd like to do an acknowledgement to country and just say, I think we're all here because we love this place and the environment, and it's, it's a very special place. And we want to thank those countless generations of Indigenous people who have cared for and looked after this place so that we may be here now to continue to look after it, as Stuart was saying, and improve it. So now I'll hand over to Erwin Weber. And he's going to give you some of the statistics and, a, and an overview of housing problems and um, social housing in other places. And then we'd like to go to solutions locally. Yes, uh, we have over 50 years experience in social housing. And uh, I worked on the Whitlam housing programs, which was very enlightening. They called back the talent from England and America to uh, do work like restore uh, the glebe instead of demolishing it for uh, high rise. And so there, was a, a, there were a lot of architects in 70 to 73 before the Aquarius Festival that uh, uh, were, there was a core group that were social and environmentally enlightened architects. And they were my lecturers as a, a part-time student working in Sydney. And uh, we'll talk about that later in Architects Then and Now. But the first, we have here uh, the Australian Bureau of St Statistics uh, on Homelessness. And statistics are, are actually important, but they're useless if they're not actually actioned and, and connect with bottom-up grassroots. So, these are very important uh, statistics. And hang on. Next page. Next page. All right. This is this is like that one. That's it's the second page. We've got um, homeless, social housing, and projected figures. So uh, what's happened in the last couple of years is um, climate change based. Um, with extreme weather events, and that's accelerated homelessness. So there's an urgency now to, uh, to connect community with governments so that they can address it in a more sensible way than they have been. So, so, so yes, we, we, Owen has actually researched at QUT uh, social housing all over the world. And there are some examples that we have, uh, but we also would like to get to what we can do, what solutions we can get, because the top down isn't happening fast enough. And we would like to empower people to go bottom up, and this is certainly the right place to do it. So, next slide, please. So, next slide, please. This is very important too. You've got four levels of uh, categories of homelessness that, that they accept. And as I say here, from a humanitarian expect perspective, all of these represent housing insecurity. And um, the, the, uh, the, the design of, of uh, social housing is very important to address this. Yep. So, yeah, this is, where, this is where we're up to. So, with, uh, Erwin was just saying, with the increased extreme weather events, particularly flood and fire in this area, 
we're going to look for, for forward to more increasing homelessness and increasing stress. This program is all about housing stress. And at the moment, um, this, you know, the top-down solutions aren't really helping. So th the rents are rising, as I was hearing people saying as we came in. Um, and there's going to be a lot of immigrants coming in the next few years. This is new federal government policy and they're not providing any housing for them. So it's going to be a greater stress on all the local people who can't afford land. And I do like Stuart's idea of actually putting together, you know, a way that we could use these 100 acre blocks and have permission to put more people on them because we don't have at the moment, you can only have one dwelling on 100 acres plus. Yeah, well, so since the, a lot happened in Australia and Europe after the war because there were a lot of homeless after the war. Um, so Housing Commission did a great job in the 40s, 50s, 60s. And um, uh, what happened by the 80s was we followed Margaret Thatcher's lead in privatisation and virtually defunded co-housing and housing and a lot of it became... Uh, they actually saw um, social housing as, as a problem issue where, and there were stigmas of in, connected with social housing. And later you'll see that the, the more uh, functional countries like the Scandinavian countries do it better. They actually uh, don't uh, connect stigma with, and, and, and a, lower, a class system with social housing. And it's important. Like, we now have less than 4% social housing. We were far more 40 years ago. Uh, we had less than 4%. Uh, England's 18, 18%, Holland's over 30% social housing, and Singapore's 90%, and Singapore's not, uh, uh, you know, it's a very advanced economy and society. So what those countries understand is that society at large and economy are benefited by... 100% housing and no housing stress. And we have to tell the governments when they're focusing on economy that economy works better when people aren't stressed. So here we are. So I did uh, a research thesis. People don't read theses, but uh, just in principle, the international research and case studies um, they, they talk about how um, public housing, social housing and community housing, like self-created uh, uh, community housing, like in the communes around Lin uh, Nimbin, uh, actually, uh, they actually work. They don't deserve that stigma. In the United States, we saw at the edge of very large cities in the 70s, we, we saw uh, on the fringes of large cities there were these vast, um, uh, what is it, they call them trailer parks. And the people we talked to said, oh, they're trailer trash. And that's a, that's a terrible, oh, it's a shocking thing, I, you know, to actually indict people as trailer trash. So uh, we don't want that sort of thinking. We want people to say, the people that are disabled or in need should, it's a human right to have housing. And it doesn't have to be the average 23 square metres of McMansion for social, it can be tiny homes. And even young people that are, uh, they're now cleverly talking about tiny homes. And, and we talk on Saturday Jalambar about uh, picking low hanging fruit and we say if you can't do it in one stage getting your dream your 23 square meter average Australian house start with step one the low hanging in other words you're picking the priorities of what's essential for your sustainability in your lifestyle and 
global sustainability. And uh, here's an example of... We spent a few days in London in 2013 with the architect that wrote the most popular self-build book they call Own a Building Self-Build. And he took us to show all of these uh, co-housing, shared equity housing around London. And in the 50s, 60s, 70s, they developed a very simple building mm -hmm. system, one architect did, and, and they'd get 30, 40 young couples that couldn't afford housing and the government then was more enlightened than post that period, I call that the change of social housing. We copied the, the British in that and gave away social housing. So um, in Sweden and Denmark and the Scandinavian and North European countries, I must say we have a benign climate. We don't die if you're living in a bus shelter. In Sweden, you would, so they have to be smarter about it. But there's no excuse for us as a, a rich, affluent society to accept hundreds of thousands of people that are living in trailers and, and parks and everything, you know. And, and, I mean, you and I can live for a period in a two-man tent, but it's by choice. But when it's not by choice, it's a different matter. Not being in a, a brown paper bag or, or a tent for several years is not acceptable, especially for women and children. So here's this part of this uh, summaries of the research that I gleaned from, well, a Newcastle University academic, there was a name on the last one, but, but I give credit to them, uh, who's been studied for decades um, social housing in these more enlightened countries trying to tell the Australian government that we can do better and that's what the subject is, doing it better because we're doing it terribly. Even after the Tweed Richmond flood, they promised thousands of fast housing and the mayor six months later said, oh, they promised us thousands that we got 13 and I think some of them went on a flat and got fl Flooded in the second, in the second flood, those 13 houses got left. So that's not very smart. So, but we have to learn from these people. Here I say, you saw that, that picture at the title um, about social housing and, and Horsham was just one of the many. And this is actually co-shared uh, equity housing that has 24 young couples most of it was owner built, self built. They call it self built in Britain, and and we talked to the people with the architect, uh, John Broom. His name was. He's very well known in London. He 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 showed it. He, we interviewed people there, and they said we own this. We have a sense of ownership. We have a sense of place. And you know, yeah, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. They actually are aren't dislocated and they're integrated with the wider community. They're not detached and have a stigma because they're detached and, and, and they're not lower class, they're part of the community and that's what we wish for, for Australia uh, because we're going in the next three years to a, a, a crisis on homelessness and housing stress. For, since Bob Hawke, Adrian and I have been working uh, pro bono on social housing, and they've all failed. We, we, uh, he said he want, Hawk said he wanted kibbutzes and give two years of the dole to people to build their own communities. We, we found 200 acres at Limpenwood, and I drew, drew up the plans, and one of the members of the committee went to Canberra, and the day before, they disappeared that department that we were, all the applications, written applications for that, and he was run the Riot Act. He was told, don't go there, don't go in social housing, it's a problem area that breeds vandalism. And the reason it breeds vandalism is that they, what we did in Campbelltown, the 
the housing for Whitlam, half of it got demolished because it had a virtually a monoculture of uh, poor old single mothers and, and thousands of delinquent kids running mug, you know, in the green belt, you know, stealing grandmother's purses and burning cars. It's, it's like a, I'm sorry to say it, and I don't want to put negative images in your mind, but it was like Stanley Kubrick's Clockwork Orange. But what, we don't want that. And I can say one little story that the part that didn't get demolished at Canberra, Campbelltown in, in this sort of low density um, or medium density housing was the South Sea Island part of uh, this thousand houses we designed. The, the big buffy Tongans and Fijians and Samoans, their kids were running riot. They just pulled them aside and said, you're grounded, grow taro in the backyard. And they survived because they actually said to their teenagers, grow up, grow veggies until you grow up. And we want a good community because if you've been like us and lived in villages in Melanesia and Polynesia, they don't have the problems we have. They, their affluence is community, not bank accounts. So, uh, anyway, I'm getting... We've been involved in pro bono in a number of... Oh, sorry. We've been involved in a number of pro bono designs for social housing in this region. Special. And where... Yes, this one. Hold it up. Um, and the problems that Erwin mentioned can actually be, um, you know, made good by having a variety of different age groups and so on, a variety of, you know, one, two three bedroom places, shared places and so on, and providing um, some social support within the community. So it's not a whole bunch of just single people who've never met turning up. And that they, and so this one here was called Sashta. It started off in um, Byron Bay, and we had a, a plot of land in Byron Bay where the council said, design something for. And then they said, no, you can't use that, but we've got a site at Mullumbimby, which we, this was designed for. It's all sustainable, local, natural materials. The people could build it themselves. And that, this site was going to be at the community garden. However, the council slightly changed and they didn't vote that it could be built. So most of the ones we've been involved in have fallen over because there wasn't a piece of land associated with them. Currently in the Tweed where we live near Mount Warning, um, there's 100 acres of um, 140, acres. 140 acres of council owned land and they actually, Wardrop. it's called Wardrop Valley Community. They actually paid you know, $40,000 to somebody in Brisbane to do a design for all different kinds of houses. 100 houses. Um, we were ready to go, it was agreed it would be rentals. It was agreed it couldn't be the most needy people because they would need their own car. It's 10 minutes out of town. And guess what? The council doesn't want to do it now. We have got the piece of land, but the council wants to sell it. <laughs> so it's very hard. But I do like Stuart's idea. And would you do a company title on that or for your 100 acre lots? Um, it's possible. I don't know much about the, the title. I was mm. thinking the Yes. Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Questions? So with my proposition, the zoning would stay the same and it would be sold as freehold title. That would be my understanding. Yep. Thank you. I'll take it. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. That's wonderful. Um, a lot of good content there and we need to move along to get um, through the program. I believe Terry McGee is going to come forward unless there are any last questions for, uh, for Erwin and, and uh, Adrian. Gentleman here. Sorry. Okay. I'll just take this last question and then we'll go. Sorry, Doctor. It's not a question. I will. I will be quick. I'm Kevin Fell. I'm from Newcastle. Uh, Newcastle Co Housing. Uh, if anyone wants to know Cecil Grimstead, I can introduce you to. I've got a number and so on. But um, uh, what can I say? Um, 
Community title, just picking up on that last point, is really versatile and allows you to do all sorts of things. So really look at community titles. Um, we've been looking at mixed equity. You can involve social housing eligible people if you get investors to take head leases and we're lining that up with a community housing provider in Newcastle. The federal government and state government have both said that they're open to audit of government land to make government land available uh, for housing. And of course, if you make the land available, say through a 99 year lease, you reduce the cost of the housing by about 40% at least. We're, we're trying to do aged care intergenerational housing as well. And meanwhile housing. There's so many vacant buildings, if you're talking about homelessness, the Catholic Church is the second largest landholder in Australia. And we've almost got a deal set up with a church in Newcastle. I won't give you the, the, the it's not signed yet. So I don't want to publicise it for a, an aged care home that's been vacant for six years, it can house 50 people and there's a group called Housing All Australians based in Melbourne, there are examples in Melbourne where they will do it for nothing, they're, they're business, business and industry people, they'll refurbish it so it can be used for nothing as long as they say at least a five year lease for you know providing housing for people. So there are a lot of things happening. Okay Terry? Um, I'll hand it to you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for that. That was very good. I will we'll jump in. Uh, uh, my name's uh, Terry McGee. I've uh, been the instigator, creator of uh, 300 home sites in the immediate Nimbin area, uh, with lots of other people, of course but uh, being the initiator, the foundation secretary of Tunnable Falls, uh, a Bill and Cliffs uh, on that side, Blue Springs up there, and also I work with the Aboriginal Land Council in Lismore, covering this whole area for five years and uh, help some balancing out at Nimbin Rocks. Um, and, uh, but before I go any further, I can I read a little quote to you? You never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. Uh, think of geodesic domes. Uh, that, that quote's from Buckminster Fuller. And in fact, uh, one of the first buildings built out at Tunnable Falls was a geodesic dome. And in order to prove that it was safe to be inhabited, uh, eight, nine, ten people climbed on the top of the geodesic dome, took a photograph and sent it into Terrania Shire Council at that time as proof of safety. And it was accepted. Uh, Tunnable Falls began right at the end of the festival when 30 people walked out from town. I'd gone out there originally beforehand by Basil. Basil Hayter was a wonderful person here in Nimbin who helped the festival happen. He was also the local baker and the local real estate agent, unlicensed, and, and the local SP bookie, also unlicensed. That's a joke. And uh, he drove me out to meet Sam Mackay, who owned the Thousand Acres out there, and did a handshake deal, came back and started finding people. And we then walked out, which we're going to recreate on Saturday, a walk out to Tunnable Falls on the 50th anniversary. This was actually the, the birth, the, the, when the sperm met the egg time 50 years ago. It took seven months to actually get cooperative registration and I'm going to mention a couple of things about structure. So I've brought in the concept that a, a different structure is needed at times. However, best not to actually reinvent the wheel too many times. Basically a cooperative, a cooperative requires legal registration and those registrar of cooperatives require a lot of jumps through hoops and, uh, and any expense 
that you incur before then is not recoverable. Uh, I had to run about, do everything around the place and landed up with very little money at Tunnable Falls when we got the registration and none of that money beforehand was able to be paid. That's one of the rules of reg cooperatives. Uh, any foundation formation costs cannot be recovered. Whereas Dharmananda, uh, did you use a uh, company title? It was totally tree, free spirit, and Mandy can throw in something there. Walla Gulla, I'll mention that in a sec. That came a little bit later, but it's one of the other chops. So I'm trying to focus here, especially for younger people that are thinking about what the options are and how structure then affects what you do afterwards. Um, Diamond uh, Dudley just threw in the information, somebody bought the land and invited people on. We, we started as a partnership, that's how people could join. Uh, a partnership, which is a little twin, but it's a... That's right. Tenant, that's called tenants in common. Okay, technically in the law, that's a tenants in common ownership, no? Yeah, no, 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 that's, that's, right. that's still tenants in common if there's a, a number of names on the title. That's... Right, so the individual, but you promised that you were going to share it and you did. Right. Co-op, a registered co-op? Oh, okay. Um, when, we went, when I went down to Sydney... I walked into the lower uh, office, said, oh, I want to register a cooperative. Uh, where? Uh, up in Nimbin. Ah, oh, we've been hearing about all cooperatives being created across there, but you're the first person that's walked in the door. And uh, so then they made us jump a lot of hoops, a lot of process, and it's easier once you've already got started to do it then, in a sense. Um, the other options, uh, originally there is Torrens title in New South Wales and that's the normal background title. But there was also strata title and as David mentioned, this building here was registered as a strata title but strata title is originally designed to just go up floors, one floor, one floor, one floor. Bill and Cliffs ended up being a strata title uh, registration, even though it's very complicated because it's got hills, but there's different heights. I think I digress. Uh, <laughs> then, then we actually have company title. A lot of the properties that have begun have been uh, under company title, where the people getting together form a small company with a uh, solicitor and buy it in that name and then get approval from council to have multiple places. Getting the council approval is part of the key process and each different council around here has in the past had a different policy uh, and often quite restrictive partially because all of these different places, importantly for you, have a different effect on your long-term costs. If you are not uh, individually titled, if you have a common ownership or if you're a cooperative that owns the whole land, uh, you will normally only pay one single rate for the whole property, irrespective of how many people are living there. Uh, and on Tunnable Force Cooperative, they receive one single rate bill and that single rate bill they cover and pay. And essentially then it becomes a little isolated community that takes care of its own internal costs. It has its own school, it has a town hall, etc., etc. but it only pays one rate even though there's 130 
houses out there, uh, they don't pay individual rates to council. Whereas on Wallagulla, right next door, each of the eight, six, eight, twelve, twelve houses there pay an individual rate to council. Hmm? Oh, company title as well. Oh, right, good. Company title example. No, you, you can do it. I'll, get, I'll do it quickly. Go. Um, we get the rates coming in. And then you divide it. That's Mandy, by the way. She's actually also one of the first people to go on to Tunnel Before's community co-op. Uh, but she now still lives in the valley. And there was an adjoining property in between uh, the Tunnel Before's land which was bought, and there was a spare little 200 acres, and so a gang of Tunnel Force people mainly bought it and, and then created a company title and get one single rate. Whereas in lots of other places, including Bill and Cliffs, uh, but lots of other places, everyone gets an individual uh, rate notice. Uh, John... Bunjalung, not Bunjalung, the gardens. Yeah, they've got individual rates coming to them. Yeah, they get an individual rate. So if you want to avoid that individual rate, which is substantial, especially over not 10 years or a lifetime, but forever, you don't get to go back on that, uh, that will be an individual large rate that you'll be paying to council. Um, so just be aware of that. That's, uh, but when you're actually in one of the other non-individual title places, you have to cooperate with each other. Even if it's not a cooperative, you have to cooperate. <laughs> and uh, that, that's why uh, the name that we the actual registration of the cooperative for Tunnable Falls was Coordination Cooperative. Uh, but, of course, sometimes when you put it in the name, people think, oh, yeah, that, take that for granted and then forget about it. But, in fact, it's really, as, <laughs> as Dudley knows, it's really necessary all the time. And also the level of structure that you think you might need, that you might... Uh, argue about later, uh, is it happens anyway. You internally will create a structure. I visited the community school on Tunnable today. And I, Tunnable is one of the least lesser structured. People don't actually have a single two acres that is their house site. In fact, they don't even own the land underneath their house. Technically, the house belongs to the land. And, uh, and so the amount of resale value, if they really, really have to go on or if they die and their children want to, the resale value will be lower because of that difference. But the school there, I visited the school and said, of course, we debated in the early days of how much freedom and how much structure that automatically limits freedom to some degree, uh, how much should we have? And I was in there looking around at the school, which was the old first house, the White House, uh, that the whole community went in during the wet season. We had to pull the ceiling off so as to create sleeping space in the roof because it was raining so much. But went into the school and, of course, I was looking around and... Uh, we debated freedom and structure in the early days and I know there's still that issue, but you've got a lot of structure in this school, haven't you? And Renee and some others said, oh, yeah, yeah, we, you don't run a primary school without structure. You can't keep your registration, but you also can't cope with the kids if you don't have structure. And every kid wants structure in their life to some level. 
And so it's that balance between the amount of structure you, you want and the amount of freedom. But I've been talking a fair bit there and I th hope I've covered some illustrations, uh, but it is that balancing act, freedom, structure, and you've, when you've got to live with other people, you may want to be free, but you don't want all of your neighbours to be too free. <laughs> Good point. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Terry. Thanks to Terry. That was a wonderful presentation. Does anyone have any questions for Terry? We're good? Okay. Um, Philip, would you like to come forward? Uh, we've got, um, got about, yep, we've got about 10 minutes left, so, um, and, and it would be good to have a little bit of discussion beyond um, just the presenters, so, that's cool. Phil, Phil Pratt. I just wanted to share a few things. Um, I just want to share a few a few things about my my experience and my understanding of low cost housing. I don't like the idea of social housing because it, it implies some sort of sort of um, you know broad government intervention. I, I, I have a belief system where I I believe that people need tenure over their own space. I, I feel that there, there's a sense of sanctuary required in in, in a dwelling. And, and very fundamental to, to human well-being. And, and these are principles that I've worked on over the last 20 years. And it, it, it's about creating quality, um, you know, the old adage, quality over quantity. So, the, you know, sure, um, you know, housing is about shelter, but it's also about, about supporting um, all the other aspects of, of what, is, what is well-being in a human being. And you know, it's, it, it's, it's light. It's about it's about a sense of, of delight. It's about joy. It's about um, connection with the with with nature. All those things. I mean, I, I won't go through the list, but um, I'm trying to integrate that into into the design process um, that I that I'm working on, while still embracing the principles of, of being low cost, as in, you know, it's um it's it's very efficient. In the way that it's, things are put together, uh, and very minimal use of um, of, of, comp of complexity um, over simplicity. So I've, I've borrowed a lot of principles from Japanese um, uh, um, traditions, which um, I've, I've integrated in, into Australian um, um, culture, and it's mainly about using using repeatable elements, about the, the idea of modular in a true sense of components rather than modular, as in as in completed units. So I'm, I'm, I've broken down my house. I won't. I, I do have a PowerPoint presentation, but I won't show the images here. But I'll just talk about it in principle. It's about breaking down the building components of, of, of platform, wall, and roof into into um, into manufacturable components that are com that can be made in a, in, a, in, a, in a controlled factory um, environment, if you like. Using we, we use a lot of cross laminated material. Timber, um, Australian hardwoods. So we're using small, small um, sections of hardwoods that are that are that are that are welded together with pressure and 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 um, and some glues. And so you need much smaller sections. They're much stronger and 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 more manageable. And and so over the years we've developed this idea of of, of bringing things down to their fundamentals um, using modular um, components. So you have a, a, a set menu of components that you can arrange in different ways rather than rubber stamping things. Um, it's really important to have that variety, have, have that connectivity so you can put different modules together um, and create complexes that, that, that can vary from site to site so you don't have that kind of, that kind of monotony of, of, um, of, uh, of just repeating things in, in, in terms of configuration but you're still using the same fundamental components. And so they're, they're just kind of principles that I, I think I just wanted to share that have been useful in, in our work. And we're, we're, t we're targeting, um, you know, we're targeting um, some government organisations, but looking to try and um, in, invoke the idea that, that everyone needs a sense of tenure and ownership of their space. 
even if they're renting or it's a collective or whether it's a um, um, all the different types of titles you can have in terms of having that sense of ownership of, 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 of sovereignty over your space I found is, is one fundamental principle that I'm that I, I, I think is immutable in, in my kind of work. So, you know, um, I'm a very graphic person, so I, I like to sort of show things um, rather than talk about them, but I, I sort of tried to encapsulate um, my principles and maybe share that with you. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Uh, Dudley is just coming up to uh, say some words. Thank you. Um, yeah, there's a whole bunch of things come up in that. And because uh, I've been involved since the very early days when uh, Tarnable Falls was threatened with demolition uh, by the local council because it was built too many houses and didn't get approval. So uh, we, uh, we had a big meeting in Nimbin and five of us sat down to say, we'll do something about it uh, around... Um, working with the government to try and work a better solution. And uh, once the state government became aware of it, they, well, we don't, this is not a good thing. This is a housing shortage way back then. And it was a problem. So the last thing we want to see is government pushing down people's homes. So they, they well, wait a minute, we'll come up and talk or come down and talk, whatever. They um, sat down with us and we worked out with the Department of of uh, uh, it wasn't Department of Urban Affairs, and, no, at any rate, whichever department it was, they all change all the time. So we negotiated and they said, well, look, you, you seem to be level-headed people. Why don't you come up with a proposal as to how the government could enable more than one housing house per hect 100 acres? That was the limit. You couldn't have more. There was really a, a planning issue primarily. So when they said, will you come up with a proposal, but we don't want any subdivision. That was a big thing. And we said, yeah, we don't want subdivision either. Fragmentation of land is not a good, a good thing at all. So we worked on it. And uh, one, one of the guys was an architect and the rest of us had different uh, skills. And we worked together negotiating occasionally, checking up with the department as to what they would be happy with. And in the end, we came up with a proposal that was called, it ended up being called multiple occupancy. And that's where that all originated. So it was to save Thunderbolt Falls, but it also enabled, in the end, people right across the whole state. It was, became a state, state environmental planning policy of 15. So it, you can work around things and that's what's important, I believe, is to work with collaboratively to come up with something that both can live with. Now, the, the, in that situation, we only paid one lot of rates. But we could be formed as a co-op or we could be a company or whatever. But it was because we were multiple occupancy that we didn't have to pay more than one set of rates. Now, that became a, a big issue down the track a lot of people weren't happy about that. How come they this, this, this? Don't have to pay more than one rate. And that was a bit of an issue, but they couldn't change it. It went on that way. And there were good arguments. Why? Because we were collective and we didn't use the road so much. And we didn't this and that. Uh, we didn't have rubbish removal or all the things that usually go along with it. So what happened was the... Um, Next thing came was the developers went, hang on, how come these people can get a bite at selling off rural land when we can't? So that's eventually led to community title. And community title, that was, a lot of people wanted that from the other side because they would all have to pay separate rates. 
and that, but that so the cost comes in because it changed from olive occupancy to community title. The reason that I fought against it and never agreed with it, should I say, was because once you fra you fragment in the community, people got this is my spot and that's your spot, and and we get we, in community title, I can go and get a bank loan, and that was a, what really was the major incentive people moving off multiple block occupancy because banks would only loan to the whole group, whatever you were, cooperative or company. So that limited, as land values went up and up and up, suddenly people said we need something else and that's why they agreed to community title. But the problem with the community title, if you're building community, is that you then have a fragmentation, you can't control who's in and who's not. Because if someone defaults, they the bank can step in and they can put whoever they want in there. So you're not con con keeping a solid community. You own it all together, you look after it all together. That's what we're interested in uh, for a lot of reasons. So um, that was one thing. Uh, the, the way that we deal with it in our, our setup, it's called the Sustainability Research Institute is doing it. And the Sustainability Research Institute, which we set up 25 more years ago, is a, a, uh, it's essentially obviously about learning what to do and how to do it well. So that means when we work on the land, we want to do a thorough job, a scientific job, to make sure we're doing it as best as we can. So this is a way of growing the knowledge of how to settle on land. That's so important. The, the company, it's a set up as a company, it's a company limited by guarantee, which is the same thing as all research institutes or universities. So that takes care of that side of it. But we don't own the land with that entity. What I've done is I've set up a separate uh, trust uh, and it's an environmental, it's enlisted as an environmental organisation, which means we get tax deductibility for uh, people that want to help us financially to get set up. So that's an advantage. We can access a government grants because we're approved by the tax office because we're doing something that is benefiting the environment. And so settlement then it has to be aligned with that. We have to make sure that the settlement is entirely environmentally sound. We can't degrade that. And we're liable to make a assessment of the impact that every year and send that to the trust. So that the trust is in making its responsibility done to remain as a, a not-for-profit trust. So that's why we've separated the two, they're at arm's length. And that gives us the advantage that everyone doesn't have to chip in the same amount of money. Because some people got lots of money, want to be part of it, want it to happen, but other people got almost nothing. So we have to make that equal. And you can't have people, well, I put in 500,000, uh, so I should have much more say than you to only put in $50. You don't want that. So we've separated the two. People can lend money to the trust and then they get that money back over time from the rent that everybody pays. So that's one way of doing it. Or you can simply donate money and get 100% tax deduction for your donation. So it means parents or somebody else can chip in and help to buy that property. But the properties then, the title is held by the trust and nobody can sell it, it's in perpetuity. It's always there. So it deals with that and then in terms of managing and running the, the property and the community, that's got nothing to do with how much money you had. What matters is that you work together as a group by consensus, you make your decision so that everybody's equally involved and equally managing the whole property. Now our community that we started that way uh, has been going for 50 years, never thought about stopping being uh, using consensus to decision making. Because once you know how to do it, contrary to popular belief, it can be done very swiftly and it serves everybody's purpose because everybody has agreed. So you don't have fragmentation and breakdown and saying, well, I didn't really agree with it, blah, blah, blah. You get every opportunity to, to have all your dissension dealt with and then you go along with the, the whole group. Even if you, maybe you don't agree, absolutely, you've got a better idea, but having been given the floor, 
constantly so that you can be well heard, then you might say, well, I'll accept going along with your group because I want to keep the solidarity of the community, but I'll put a note in the minutes to say that, you know, I didn't agree. So that down the track, it's a record. That sometimes gets you over the hump and gets those people to go along. But you must get that consensus. So I guess we've run out of time. There's a lot more could be said, but yeah, did you want to ask a question? Thank you, Dudley. Dudley's an Aquarian. A pre-Aquarian. I give the analogy by Pooh Bear, children's book, if you don't know. He said, honey or condensed milk? Pooh Bear said both. And I connect that analogy with social housing or self-actualised housing. I say both. There's a range in our society to, to attain real social equity in this country, in Nimbin, in Northern Rivers and in Australia, you need both. You have, with all due respect to people that disagree, and they're allowed, but I say with all due respect, there are people in the, when I said, I didn't define in the talk shared equity. They're in a shared equity co-housing, you have a range for diversity of zero input of money, that's disabled people and people in great need. And we have now hundreds of thousands of those people and more every day. So they're the zero input and they're helped in share equity.